This morning I just want to talk about um, church goals and just, just reflecting on you know, the, the church leading up to starting the church and also um, I guess some things that I would like to do uh, when it comes to the church. But you know, first of all, I would just like to say I wasn't expecting to receive a gift this morning, but I, I first of all just would like to say you know, thank you so much um, to everyone at this church. Um, you know, thank you so much just for the fellowship that you provide um, for my family and, and everyone else here. You know, there's so few of us these days that believe like we do. So it's good to have a church like this where you can have friends and um, people to hang out with and people to, to talk with and get that fellowship. Um, I want to thank you as well just for your financial support as well. I'm, I'm just so amazed at the generosity uh, of people, the people of God, just to our family and to this church. It, it's amazing when I see the funds come in. Um, uh, you know, I, 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 I'd never imagined that it would be uh, at the level it's at. So we don't, we've never struggled at all for finances. I mean, that's, that's one of the things I definitely was concerned about when I started the church. And that's partly the reason why I thought, hey, I'd keep a job because I didn't want to have to worry about these things. And I haven't had to in the past year. So thank you so much for that. And I just thank you so much as well, just for the work that you guys do, you know, for the work that you put in and, you know, because that really is the greatest encouragement to my family. You know, to me, the, the finances are, are an afterthought. You know, sometimes, you know, Michael always has to remind me to go collect the money from the box there because I'm not even thinking about that sort of stuff. And it's more a hassle, right? Because you have to count it and bank it and keep track of it and all the receipts and things like that. And you know what encourages me and my family is the work that you put in. When I see people go soul winning week after week, when I see you here serving one another and taking care of one another, you know, that's where I get encouraged and that's where our family gets encouraged to continue to do what we do. So um, thank you so much for the work that you've put in um, to making this church as great as it is. Now, you know, when I, when I thought about what I wanted to say this, this morning, uh, in regards to the church anniversary, I just want to sort of reflect on the first meeting uh, that we had when we were here because uh, a lot of you weren't here when we started the church uh, on 1st of March, you know, 2015. And, you know, when, when I uh, was first thinking about starting the church, I remember when my ordination was in question and uh, not, not questionable, but just in, we were talking about it because um, we had actually been planning this church uh, ever since we went to Lighthouse Baptist Church and probably about a year in, we started seriously planning and thinking about where it was going to be and when we were going to go out um, and all that sort of stuff, working with Mark Tossel. And, you know, I never thought I was ready. You know, even now, you know, it's like parenting. You're never ready. You just got to jump in with both feet and just, um, you know, uh, trust that God will use um, the work that you're trying to do. So, you know, I never thought I was ready to um, pastor a church or to be a bishop. But, um, you know, here we are a year later and, um, you know, I still think I've got a lot to learn and, 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 um, and much to grow. So when it came to my ordination, you know, I left it up to God. I did, I did not push Mark Tossel to send me out. I, I wasn't in a rush to get out. I remember telling Mark Tossel, you know, whenever you believe I'm ready, whenever you think is the right time, that's when I'll go. Because if you would ask me when I want to go, I probably won't go out. You know, I'll just, well, I'm comfortable. I was comfortable at Lighthouse. You know, it was comfy there. We, had, we knew what we were doing. We, we, we had our ministries there. Um, so it was easy to just put it off and say next year, next year, next year. Um, but when Mark said, hey, I think, you know, you should start looking for a place, that's when it started to um, become a bit more real to us. And, you know, you know, I don't think, I don't think I'm the most spiritual or the most talented or the most charismatic person there is um, when it comes to, to being a bishop. So, you know, I'm just, I believe I'm just a man that was willing to be used by God. And, you know, this, I want to be, this to be an encouragement to you because God can use you. You know, because it, it's funny that there are people that are much more talented, much, much more charismatic than I am. And, and generally, you know, they, they uh, you know, I guess would get followers a lot easier than somebody like myself. But this is what I love about this church is that I'm not, you know, this great visionary. I'm not this great charismatic person. But the people here are banded together under the Word of God because we love the positions that we take here. We love the Word of God. We love the King James Bible. We love salvation by grace. We love eternal security. We hate repenting of your sins to be saved. And it's things like that that bring us together. And I just think that's a, that's a beautiful thing. Um, you know, so God 
can use you to do great things. It do, you don't need to be some, you know, da King David. You don't need to be somebody great. Just if you just use what you have to do what you can for the Lord, God can use you. And you know, that comes down to the men as well. You know, when it comes to being a bishop, hey, God can use you. You know, it, you know, being a bishop, it's not about having this great talent. It's not about being this great person. It's just meeting some specific criteria in the Bible and having a desire to do that. You know, a lot of people, they, they have this frame of mind that if you want to serve as a bishop, that you need to have some special calling from God. But as we read in 1 Timothy 3, we read in Titus that, you know, Titus says, if any be blameless. You know, 1 Timothy 3 says, you know, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth the good work. So what it comes down to is not this magical, you know, nebulous calling from God. You know, God it calls every man to say, hey, is any blameless? Does any desire the office of a bishop? And if you meet these qualifications and if you have the desire, hey, God can use you to do great things. You know, people often will say, you know, the Lord willing, right? They say, if the Lord willing, we'll do this and do that. Well, in this case, he's always willing. He's always willing for you to serve him. He's always willing to use you. The question is, you know, are you willing? Are you willing to do that? You know, some of the thoughts I had, you know, leading up to um, uh, starting this church, and, and, and Michael can, can remember back to when we, you know, we'd stand outside the building of Lighthouse Baptist Church and talk about these things. And, you know, some of the concerns I would have, I'd say, you know, who would, who would want to go to a church pastored by me? You know, like, I, who, who am I? But, you know, it, that's why it's been amazing just to see, you know, where you guys have all come from and, 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 and gathering here under this, under this house here. Um, you know, and I don't think it's actually about me. I think it's about the positions that we take that bond us together. You know, I always had this fear that when we started this church, it would just be my family and Michael for years and years and years and years. <laughs> so, you know, uh, like when we started this church, we always joke, oh man, I was thinking, oh, if like after two, three, four years, it's just my family and Michael, can I keep, can I keep doing that? I don't know. Like, would I give up by then? Um, I tried to always remind myself, hey, you just keep going and, you know, just keep serving the Lord. It doesn't matter who's here. But God has greatly blessed and God has, um, you know, even our very first gathering, you know, we had 22 people just come out of the woodwork. You know, I didn't know who was going to come to this church. You know, I, I just thought it was going to be my family and Michael and another lady that had started the church with us um, at the time. But, uh, you know, people just started to contact us, came, come out of the woodwork and, and started coming along and we had a nice little core group and uh, helped us to get the work done here. So that was really great. Let's go to Matthew 16. Uh, Matthew 16. Let's read here, Matthew 16. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. I think for anyone that starts a church and, and starts it from scratch, you know, this is one of the verses they constantly go to to remind themselves, hey, it's not me that's building this church. It's not like King Nebuchadnezzar where you look out and say, hey, look at this great thing that I have built. I honestly don't think I've, I, I've done that much to, to build this church in terms of get this group of people together. When we came out here, we just were preaching the word, we we're preaching the gospel, we we're getting, getting the name out there just to try and put it on the internet and put it on Facebook. And I really honestly believe that God has built this church. He has brought these people together. And that's something that we need to constantly be reminded of, that it's not our job to build the church. Our job is to preach the gospel. Our job is to stand for the word of God, and God will build his church in his time. Our job is to preach the gospel and to love people. This is an interesting verse in 1 Samuel 10. It says here about Saul, And Saul also went home to Gibeah, 
And there went with him a band of men whose hearts God had touched. So when Saul was anointed king, there was a group of men that went with him and it wasn't Saul trying to coerce him, coerce them to follow him. There was a band of men whose hearts God had touched that wanted to follow Saul because it was the will of God in their life. So, you know, I had to remind myself about these things, you know, just to remind myself. Obviously, you, you know, when you start something like this, you get in the flesh and you think, oh, you know, what else can I do? Like, what, what you know, is, you know, who's going to, who wants to follow me? Like, who wants to be under my leadership? But it's not about me. You know, it's about the Lord Jesus Christ. It's about his word. And people get excited about that because that's what this church is about. Now, let's go to Luke 5, just briefly. If you haven't, you can go back on YouTube and actually watch the first sermon that I preached back in the 1st of March, 2015. And it was this passage here in uh, Luke 5. We'll just read from verse 36. And he spake also a parable unto them, saying, No man putteth a piece of a new garment upon an old. If otherwise, then both the new maketh a rent, and the piece was taken out of the new, agreeeth not with the old. And no man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. But new wine must be put into new bottles, and both are preserved. No man also having drunk old wine straightway desireth new. For he saith, the old is better. So I preached a sermon called A New Bottle. And I, I sort of alluded to this passage, just how Jesus says, hey, you know, you don't fix an old garment by tearing up a new garment. You don't put new wine into old bottles because the bottles are going to burst. And, and I sort of took the idea saying, hey, you know, sometimes when you want to do things right, you need to start over again. And, you know, many of us had come from different churches. Many of us had come from different backgrounds. And we were just sick and tired of the false doctrine in churches. We were sick and tired of the errors. We were sick and tired of the biblic, unbiblical practices that we generally see in churches these days. And, you know, we've often in our own church, we've tried to change things. We've tried to influence things. And it's like this. We're, we're putting, we're taking a new garment and trying to fix this old garment. We're taking new wine and putting it into an old bottle. And sometimes you just need to start over. And that's why this was what was exciting about this church is we could take, press the reset button. We could start over and go back to the Bible and see, hey, how are things done in the Bible? And let's try and do it as closely as we can. And I, you know, I remember the first meeting. You know, it was a bit awkward. And I, for, for those of you who were, who were there, you know, the first meeting that we had, I remember it was awkward because it was a bit different. Um, you know, people didn't know what to expect. Um, but, you know, I guess now we're, we're just sort of used to it. This is how the church in Punchbowl rolls. You know, this is, this is how it is. But I hope we don't just stagnate in tradition. You know, I hope that we constantly are sharpening each other, that we're constantly seeing what does the Bible say? Can we do things different? Can we do things better? Can we do, you know, are we doing something that's, that's not right? You know, let's uh, continue to uh, learn the Word of God and continue to strive forward. And, you know, you know, we're not, you know, we're not just tr being different just for the sake of being different. You know, is this church different just because we want something unique, right? We want to, you know, come to the church in Punchbowl. It's something unique like you've never tasted before. No, we're not just trying to be different just for the sake of being different. We just want to get back to the Word of God. We just, we were just striving to get back to the Bible and to keep things as simple as possible. So, you know, one thing you just want to reflect on this is, you know, obviously now we're starting to get used to it. We're starting to get used to what this church is like. But what I want you to think about today, just with that thought, is are we starting to take, are we, are we starting to take it for granted? Do you know what I mean? Because if you remember before this church existed, it was, man, I wish there was a church like this. I wish there was a church that believed the post-trib pre-wrath rapture, right? I wish there was a church that didn't preach repent of your sins to be saved. I wish there was a soul-winning church. I wish there was a church that didn't have the Sunday schools and all this, you know, all these bells and whistles that just separated up the group, that we just had one church together with the children there. Do you remember that feeling when, when it wasn't there and you wanted to be a part of that? But then when it exists, you start to take it for granted. You start to realize it's there already. You start to not want to be at church anymore. You know, you, you start sort of slipping in your Christian life. You know, before when this church didn't exist, you wanted a church that went soul winning. You wanted a church that knocked the doors. Well, now it's here. You know, so let's go. Let's get out there. Let's get part. Let's, let's, get, let's get involved 
with the soul winning because that's what we're here to do. We're here to preach the gospel to the people in this area and to preach the gospel to the world. So think about that. You know, we wanted a church like this. Now it's here. Are you starting to take it for granted? You know, I remember sharing this actually at Faithful Word. When I left Faithful Word, we, we, when it was on the, the camping trip, and we were giving testimonies, and I was telling the people at Faithful Word, I was saying, you know, do you realize how blessed you are to have this church here? You know, because at that time, Australia didn't have a church like this. And I was saying, you know, because people around the world, they, they wish they were in a church like this. You know, they wish there was a church like this in their area. You know, but for the people at Faithful Word, you know, they're starting to take it for granted that it's there. It's so easy for them. Um, but also for us now that have been in a church like this for a while, let's not us take it for granted as well and continue to be thankful and thank God for what we have here. Now, just moving on, like there's, there's a couple of things, you know, where it comes to things that I would like to accomplish um, just in terms of my own life and what I'd like this church to accomplish. Uh, you know, I'm not limiting it to just these things because obviously, you know, God can do greater things than I can even imagine. You know, you can do greater things than I can even imagine. You know, it's just whether or not you're willing to use your talents and abilities to serve the Lord. Uh, you know, and I, you know, I heard a saying once when it comes to serving the Lord, you know, if you can find a need, fill it. Do you know what I mean? Like, you, you don't have to wait for somebody to ask you to serve the Lord or, or ask or to find out something for you or what you can do to serve the Lord. If you see something lacking, then fill that need. If there's something that needs to be done and nobody's doing it, hey, maybe that's why you exist. I, I didn't have that passage in my notes, but I always think of Gideon. You know, Gideon talks about, you know, the Lord is here. You know, why are we like this? Why, why are we under oppression? And what does God, God say to Gideon? Have not I made thee? You know, this is why you are made. It's just like Esther, right? It, it, when Mordecai says to Esther, you know, what if you are in this position, position for such a time as this? You know, so when you see the need, you know, we often complain, don't we? We say, hey, oh, you know, yesterday there was the Mardi Gras. You know, and homosexuality is obviously a sin. It's, it's an abomination. And in fact, God prescribes the death penalty. You know, homosexuals should be executed uh, for committing the fornication that they do. And not just homosexuality, it's also adultery and, and other things like that too. You know, sleeping with animals. So, you know, we complain about these things. We say, oh, you know, look at the world. You know, look at the Mardi Gras that's happening. Look at the world and, and look at, you know, the ungodliness and the fornication and the fact that they hate God and they don't want anything to do with God. But what are you doing about it? Do you know, like, where were you last Sunday? Where were you the Sunday and Saturday afterwards when we had soul winning? Because at the end of the day, you know the reason why the world believes that homosexuality is okay? It's because they believe, they don't believe the Bible is the word of God. I mean, at the end of the day, that's where the, that's where the rubber meets the pavement. We need to convince people that the word of God that the Bible is the Word of God so that they'll believe it and then they'll believe these abominations are wrong. But where, but where were you? Where were you when, when we needed to preach the gospel? Where were you when we need to convince people that the Bible is the Word of God? See, we can't complain about these things. We can't complain about the world and where it's going when we're doing nothing about it. right? Because God has. that's why we're here. We are the light of the world. We are the salt of the world. But if the salt hath lost its savour, wherewith shall it be seasoned? Right? So we have to do something about it. We can't complain about the things that need to get done in this world and then do nothing about it. That's the reason why, you know, and I'm not trying to exalt myself today, but you know, that's the reason why I started this church. You know, like I said, I, don't, I never saw myself as some great leader. I still don't see myself as some great leader. And that's why it's funny when people sometimes talk about our church and they say it's like a cult following. People are following me. I'm like, who would want to follow me? Like, you know, like how can I be some cult leader? I can't convince anyone to, to I can't even convince people to come to church and alone drink some Kool-Aid to, to, to kill themselves or whatever. You know, so, it, 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 you know, I never saw myself as this great leader, but then I knew, hey, Australia doesn't have a church like this. And who else is doing it? So I just thought, hey, you know what? If nobody else is going to do it, hey, if the time comes, if I meet the qualifications and I'm able to start that, I'm going to do it and see what happens. You know, because God can use what I'm willing to give Him uh, to bring Him glory. So there's a couple of things I want to accomplish. You know, obviously, you know, the number one, one of the goal, main goals of this church is to see you all grow in the faith. So, so one of the things I think about is, you know, I want to provide an atmosphere in this church for you to grow and to flourish um, as a Christian. 
And that's why, you know, we run things the way we do. That's, this is the, you know, this is the whole reason why we even go to the trouble of having lunch after church. You know, it's not just because, I don't know if you know what the reasoning is behind it. The reason, the reason why we go to the trouble of having lunch and having it here, because I don't want, I didn't want people to have to go somewhere else to have lunch. Because you know, that's, that happens in a lot of churches where, you know, after the church meeting is over, there's no food, right? But then it's lunchtime. So people have to go and get food. So that's when everyone splits off and it do their, does their own thing and the fellowship ends. So this is the reason why we have food after the meeting because we're trying to get people to stick around, to talk and to get to know one another, to make friends and to encourage and build each other up in the faith. So we want to provide an environment for you to flourish in your spiritual walk. And that's why, you know, I don't control what people talk about here and I don't control, you know, you know, if you believe something and you want to talk to people about it here, hey, fine, come here and talk about it. Because, you know, this is where you ought to come and talk about the Bible and talk about spiritual things because if you can't do it here in the house of God, where can you do it? Right? So this is what the sort of environment I want to create because I want people to come here and be free to talk about the Word of God. Hey, if you believe something that's contrary to everybody else here, hey, come and try and convince us. You know, try and, you know, it, it, this is your chance to, to try and preach it to everyone and see whether you can convince anyone. And, and we'll all study the Word of God together and grow together. So, you know, this is why we want to encourage you to go soul winning. You know, because we're trying to provide an environment for you to grow. And we know that if you get involved in the soul winning, you will grow in the faith. You know, there's only so much growth you can have, you know, if you think about bodybuilding, right? And some of you guys here probably go to the gym and work out. And you can only build so much muscle just from eating, right? I mean, if you're just eating and eating and eating and not doing any work, I mean, you're not going to get stronger. It's the same in your spiritual life. You're not going to get spiritually stronger if all you do is eat and eat and eat and don't do any soul winning. Don't do any work. So that's the reason why we encourage people to uh, get out and win the souls because we want you to grow in your faith. And, you know, if you're not comfortable with coming to church and being encouraged to go soul winning, then, you know, maybe this is not the place for you. Uh, but, you know, this is why we do that because we want you to come here and feel a bit uncomfortable. You know, feel a bit uncomfortable because it's going to get you to change. It's going to get you to, to move in the right direction. So I want to see you all grow in the faith. I mean, I would, I would love, you know, you all to get to the point where you're pushing me. You know, that's, well, that's what I would love. You know, generally those of us who are more mature in the faith, we're used to encouraging others to go soul winning, encouraging others to read their Bible, encouraging others to get to church. You know, I'd love to get to the point where, you know, people have to encourage me as well. Like it's, it's a bit of, it's two ways, right? And we're all uh, pushing each other forward. Hey, I'd love our church to, to start new churches. You know, we, we've got Kevin on the horizon, you know, thinking of going up to the Sunshine Coast. I'm trying to try and convince him to go to Brisbane, but, you know, I don't know whether he's going to change his mind. But, you know, hey, we want to start a new church, but not just Kevin, right? Hey, Kevin came here pretty much already made, ready to go. It's just a matter of timing now. But, hey, I'd love to see some other guys step up to the plate and, and say, hey, you know what? I see a need in Australia for good churches, churches that are preaching the gospel, preaching salvation by faith alone. Hey, and we're going to step up. You're going to step up and to the plate and take that position. So I'd love to see churches, new churches started throughout all New South Wales, throughout all Australia. Um, that would be great. Hey, I'd like to see this map completely highlighted. I mean, this is what we've done so far. I mean, you look at the map, that, that actually represents about 10,000 doors, um, which was done on, on average. And I'll go through the stats a bit later. But hey, I'd love to see that map fully highlighted. Hey, and if we were all involved with the soul winning, uh, it would get highlighted a lot quicker. A lot quicker. A couple of other ideas I have, and these are not major. You know, I'd like to create like an audio, my own audio Bible, and um, not so much just for, for because I think people want to listen to my to my um, my reading of the Bible, but just something to leave for my kids, and also something that's not copyright, right? Because most of the audio Bibles out there are, are copyrighted. I don't, I want to make more of those children videos. Um, I want to create. You know, a homeschooling community where, you know, we have a community of parents that are homeschooling their children and we can do outings together and things like that. Another idea I thought would be cool is to have, uh, you know, this, this idea sort of stemmed from something Kevin was working on when he wanted to create a church directory of churches that didn't believe, repent of your sins, that we could invite people to or send people to go to these churches. I think a cool idea would be if there was a church directory out there that was actually filterable and sortable by doctrine. 
Um, so there's not actually something out there right now because generally when you go to a church directory, it's generally um, you know that denomination or people that believe like that. Um, but I think, hey, it might be a good business idea if somebody wanted to do that is to create a church directory that was actually filterable by doctrine and a church had to state what they believed and somebody could filter it based on those, on those requirements to find a church that believed like they do. Um, some other things. I mean, I don't know whether we'll ever get to this point, but, you know, where we could have some public debates, where we could take on the greats. I don't know whether I will ever get to that point, but maybe somebody here can. When you know enough about Islam, when you know enough about Jehovah's Witnesses, when you know enough about Mormonism, you know enough about Catholicism, where we could actually go to the leader of the Catholic Church or the Imam at the local, you know, mosque and say, hey, let's, let's, let's go, you know, bring it on, let's fight and see who really has the truth. And, you know, I, I think it'd be great to be involved in that. You know, we're all for the soul winning, but, you know, hey, there are other things we can do as well to get the word out. So public debates, I think, are a good idea. You know, Kevin and, uh, Kevin and uh, Michael and I were talking yesterday just about you know, public demonstrations. You know, like how, when was the last time you took part in a pro-life march? Just things like that where, you know, wh why, why, you know, why don't we get involved in those things? You know, I'm preaching to myself as well because I, I don't go along to them either. But you kind of think, you know, hey, you got the fags at, at the Gay and Pride Parade yesterday. You know, they're, they're happy to get out there and march down the street in their bikinis and stuff like that and do the, the filth that they do. But where are all the Christians? You know, like, where are all the Christians doing something where the public can see, you know? And the people, that, and, and you know, I'm not talking about the Catholics that don't even believe the gospel and they go on the news and represent Christianity. I'm talking about the Bible-believing Christians. Like, where are they uh, standing up for the truth? So, public demonstrations. And, you know, all th these are just some ideas that I had, but, you know, these things don't need necessarily to be spearheaded by me. This is why, look, if you've got an idea, if there's something you want to do, hey, you know, if you spearhead it and it's something that agrees with the Bible, it's something that we stand for, hey, I'll get behind you. You know, you spearhead it and I'll, I'll push that arrow along with the influence that I have. Um, so there's a couple of things I, I would like to do, you know, in, in the coming years. But, you know, where do I see our church in the next few years in terms of, you know, the next maybe two or three years? You know, I would say that in, you know, because I, I work a full-time job right now, I'd like to see maybe in the next two years or so where I wouldn't need to work a full-time job. Um, and this is, not, this is not a call to give more money to the church. Hey, I, I think our church has enough money for the people that it does have. You know, I work a job right now. I mean, I'm not saying get to the point where I can be a bishop full-time because of the financial support. I'm saying I'd like to see our church get to the point where there is enough people that it requires a full-time worker. Because, you know, I'm not going to quit my job and then, you know, pastor full time just because the money is there. Because if the work is not there, then there's no point quitting my job, right? Because there's, there's not that many people here to actually have to minister to. But if our church gets to the point where it does require that, I think that would be great. And, hey, you know, we can make that happen. You know, we can make the church grow. And, you know, the, the things that we need to run the church in terms of finances, hey, those things will come. There's those things we don't have to necessarily worry about. So you can all make this happen sooner, you know, by getting out there, inviting people to church, getting people involved in the ministry here. You know, I hope that in the next couple of years as well that we will have grown out of the house. You know, that, you know, we've got a big crowd here today because um, it's anniversary Sunday. Generally, we run about... 30, I'd say. I'd say the capacity of this house is maybe 50 to 60, I reckon. You know, I reckon we could probably crowd that many people in here before we have to move. But if anyone knows of a building, you know, I, I'm not against moving into a larger building. Um, I guess it's more the cost, whether it's necessary or not. But if anyone knows of an empty building, you know, I know Lighthouse was paying like 700 a week for the, the, their building and a house next to it because it was part of the Anglican church. So if there's something like that, we pay 600 a week here. So, you know, there's something like that for 700 weeks. I mean, that'd be a no-brainer. We might as well move anyway, right? And, um, and, and move into a larger place. And then it won't be so crowded for us here. And the other thing, you know, I'd love to start seeing Muslims want to the Lord. You know, we've been working hard, you know, learning about Islam, you know, reaching the Muslims out there. I'd love to see in the next one year, two years, that we actually start winning some Muslims to the Lord and they come here and start growing and actually fighting Islam themselves. All right, let's go to Matthew 28. Uh, 
And I guess what I just want to finish on is just getting us back to why we're here. And I've been talking about it with the soul winning and things like that, but I just want to emphasize it again on our anniversary. Because you know when people call and they ask about our church, generally the line of questioning is, you know, what do you believe about this? What do you believe about that? What's your position on end times? What's your position on salvation? All these sorts of things. They, so they call, and they talk to me about all these things, and I, I explain to them this is a position on this and on this and on this and on this. But I always like to just remind them, you know, yeah, we hold these positions and these positions are important to us. But if you were to ask me what's the most important thing at our church, it's the soul winning. That's what we're about. That's why we started this church. Man, if it was just about, you know, having a building and getting together and, uh, you know, having the right positions, man, we could have we done that at Lighthouse. You know, could have just stayed at that building, stayed together, had a bigger group, had to make get a bigger building. Get the, the the reason why we started this church was not just for any other reason other than to preach the gospel to this area. You know, this is the reason why we exist here. The reason why why did we choose Punch Bowl? It's because there was a church out at La Perouse, and you've got churches out at Liverpool, and you've got churches up at Blacktown, and there was no church in this area, so this is where we started. Yeah, and it's funny because when, when we started this church, people were saying, oh, you know, it's dangerous in a Muslim area. Well, who else is going to reach them? Remember I said, you know, you find a need and you fill it? Well, nobody else wanted to reach the Muslims in this area. But we came here and we're, we are reaching them. We're preaching the gospel to them. And we'll see a bit later how many people have actually gotten saved in this area, how many people have heard the gospel in this area since we came. Here's the Great Commission, Matthew 28. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So there's three things there. And let's just go over them one at a time on this last thought here. Now, number one, it says here to teach all nations. We read in Mark 16, 15, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And like I said, when I talk to people on the phone, I remind them, hey, you know, yeah, we have these strong positions. We do believe certain things, but what binds us ultimately all together is the desire to see people saved because we're willing to put our differences aside. Hey, I'm willing to, to, to work with somebody that has a slightly different position to me, you know, obviously not on the gospel, but I'm willing to put our differences of end times aside, maybe even our differences on the Bible, position of the Bible. You know, there's different positions amongst King James only people. I'm willing to put those differences aside for the one goal, hey, let's work together to get people saved and convince them into the kingdom of God. So number one, it's to preach the gospel. That's one of our purposes as a church. And you know, one thing I just want to talk about is, you know, why do we knock doors? You know, because there are many methods you can use to get the gospel out, right? But why are some churches just adamant about door knocking? Now, I'm not of the position that door knocking is the only legitimate method. Now, if somebody's going to go and, you know, street preach or open air preaching or letter boxing and do all these other things, you know, have radio programs and all that sort of thing. Hey, I'm all for that. Have you got the resources and time to do those sorts of things? Hey, more to it. You know, I, I look at in, in, uh, in America where Answers in Genesis have just made the Ark Encounter and the Creation Museum. Hey, that sort of stuff is great. I just wish they preached the right gospel. You know, everyone's giving millions and millions of dollars to Answers in Genesis to make an Ark, to make a museum, to preach, repent of your sins, to be saved. And that's why I don't give any money to it. You know, I think it's, I, I think it's great that they have those ideas I just wish somebody that believed the right gospel was doing things like that. Or people were, you know, would support something that was giving the right gospel so that great things like that have right doctrine. Um, so I don't, think, I don't think knocking doors is the only legitimate message, uh, is the only legitimate method. But you might wonder, you know, why do we emphasize the door knocking? What's, why, what's important about door knocking? The reason is, is because think about this. Let's say you had all these bells and whistles. You had the radio program, you had the advertising, you put up the billboards, you had the podcasting, you, you did the gospel rallies and the conventions, and you did all this stuff to preach the gospel to people. But then your neighbor, five doors down, never went to any of those things, never drove past the billboard, never tuned into the radio program. Isn't that sad? 
Isn't it sad that you invested all this time and all this money into preaching the gospel and yet the people within uh, you know, a hundred meter radius of your church building didn't even hear the gospel? And what about the people in a 200 meter radius, 300, you know, two kilometer radius didn't even hear the gospel? So how are we going to get the gospel to them? Well, the, only, the only logical way is you've got to go find them, right? You've got to go find where they live and go talk to them. And this is, why, this is why politicians use door knocking. This is why door knocking will always be around. Sales people will always do knock doors. Politicians will always knock doors because they know that's one way you're going to reach people that you cannot reach any other way. Yeah, yeah, you might be able to reach a vast population you know, with the broadcasting and the advertising and all that sort of stuff. And that requires a lot of money, first of all. Right? How much money does it cost to walk down the street and knock a door? It costs nothing, right? It's just God just needs you to do it. You just need manpower to do that. But that's why it would be sad. It would be a sad, sad day if we had a church here for 10, 20, 30 years and somebody a couple of blocks over has never even had their door knocked on to say, hey, consider where you're going to spend eternity. That's why we knock doors. And that's why we'll always knock doors because we want to make sure where God has put us, those people are being reached. So it'd be sad if we didn't reach the area God put us in. You know, Anastasia actually is, a, is, a, is an example of somebody we reached out door knocking because, you know, hey, Anastasia, she believed the things, and sorry, I didn't tell you I was going to talk about you today, but, you know, you know, Anastasia believed the things that we believed. You know, why wasn't she in a church? I don't know, ask her. But, you know, it's, uh, my point is, you know, sometimes God's sheep aren't always seeking where he is. But, hey, God's sheep are seeking those people. You know, because maybe Anastasia would have never heard about this church had we not knocked on her door, you know, a couple of months ago. And, and thank God she's here. And because of her, you know, people have gotten saved. People have gotten baptized. Um, and that's a, it's a great thing. So it's equally sad, you know, it's sad if we don't reach the people that in the area that, we, um, has, that God has put us. But isn't it equally sad if we don't reach the people in our area just because we didn't have the manpower to reach them? You know, think about the area that we've reached in the last year. But if everyone in church was involved in the soul winning, man, that area would have tripled. It would have quadrupled. I mean, maybe we would have already knocked the Watson electorate um, had everyone been involved multiple times a week. You know, we could have done so much more. So it's, it's sad if we don't reach somebody because there's no door knocking. But equally, it's sad as well if we don't get to the people we could have got to if not everyone is involved. So the, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. You know, some people ask, does door knocking work? I just want to put, I put some stats together for you. So we use, we use a pro, for those of you who don't know, we use a, a program called Spotio, which is a, a door knocking app um, for salespeople. And then basically when you knock on a door, you can record what happened at that door and and we can use it for multiple things, but one thing we can use it for is we can get an idea, we can just see the statistics of what has happened in the last year. And I've got a couple of interesting statistics down the bottom. But, you know, the purpose of door knocking, the purpose of preaching the gospel, like I said in the beginning, it's not to build a church. You know, the purpose is not to get people along to church, it's, it's to get people to hear the gospel. So the purpose of preaching the gospel is so that people have an opportunity to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why the number I like to focus on is really from the status of yellow and up, where you have people that have heard the gospel, either we're following up with them, they got saved, and so on and so forth. That's the number I like to focus on. Some people only focus on the number that is saved. But see, you know, it's, you, you cannot control that. You, you can't control somebody believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. But what you can control is how many people you preach the gospel to, how many doors you knock. You can control that. And ultimately, people will get saved if you knock on enough doors, if you preach the gospel enough times. So I like to focus on that number because I think the success of any soul winning program is not how many people get saved, not how many uh, people come to church. It's how many people have heard the gospel. Because sometimes you're watering, sometimes you're sowing, sometimes you're reaping. So if you base the success of a garden based on how much, you know, or you base the success of, of a gardener by how much he reaps fruit, but he never sows, he never waters, then you've got the wrong measure. You need to look at the whole picture. So, well, does soul winning work? Well, let's have a look at the statistics. So, these, so you have in column B the last three months, and then column D is all our data ever since we started. 
Now that includes some of the doors knocked, a few doors knocked in Perth, it's a few doors knocked you know, in different other places of people that use Spotty as well, that have our login. Um, plus or minus a couple of hundred, but you'll, you'll get a ballpark figure in terms of the total number of doors knocked. So we've knocked, as a church, 12,140 doors in total. Um, that's amazing when you think about, most of us only go once a week, and that's an average of about 10 people every week. 10 people. 10 people going soul winning on average about once a week, knock 12,000 doors. So imagine if it was 20. Imagine if it was 50. Imagine if it was 100. I mean, I, I don't even think a group of 100 is that big. Do you know what I mean? A hundred people going soul winning? I mean, that's not big compared to like some other like political groups of people going canvassing. You know what I mean? Like, just imagine like what we, that's why it's, money's not the answer. Money's not what's going to get people saved. God just needs you to get involved, you know? Because that's 10 people, so that's on average people knocking about a thousand doors each. And that's a lot of doors, you know. I mean, most times when you go out soul winning and you go door knocking, you might knock on 10 to 20 doors if you get into a conversation. So a thousand doesn't sound like a big number, but that's a big number when it's just one person doing that um, over a year. A couple of other interesting things. So total doors knocked, 12,140. Total doors aren't... I, I say total doors answered is basically the total without the not home. So if you knock on a door and the person is not home... I like to look at the percentages without the not homes because really, you know, it's about how many people you actually talk to. If you're knocking on doors, you're really just letterboxing those houses um, and they don't take a lot of time. You're just sort of knocking it and move on and leave a track. So total doors answered is 6,810. Total houses letterboxed, so that's the, the difference, 5,330. So people that, you know, only for letterbox, hey, we letterbox a lot too, you know, just do it at the same time. Um, we letterbox 5,000 houses. Um, now this is a total at least that heard the gospel. 829 people. Now that's a lot of people considering, you know, 10 people soul winning, I think. I think we did an amazing job, you know, in the words of Donald Trump. Um, did an amazing job. Uh, 829 so it's like, eight, I mean, most people, you know, on average, probably most people would give the gospel to like one or two people a year, right? Um, so when we go door knocking, look how many people heard the gospel. Total saved, 74. Isn't it interesting? Look at the percentage of the total saved, 1.09%. And obviously statistics don't control, you know, whether or not people get saved or not. But, but if you look at the statistics of our soul winning, 1% of the people who answer the door get saved. So what does that mean? That means if you knock however many doors, if a hundred people answer, or well according to these statistics, right, if a hundred people answer, one of them will get saved. So you know that, hey, if you're going to knock a hundred doors, eventually you're going to get somebody saved, um, according to these statistics. And obviously that's not entirely accurate, because obviously those of us who may be more experienced are getting more of those numbers than others. But it's, it's not about so much um, individual talent because everyone getting involved is making this happen. Um, the last thing I just wanted to say here with the numbers that I thought you might find interesting is the total that are aggressive. Now we have a status here. If you're wondering what all the statuses mean, so not, not home is self-explanatory. Not interested is when they don't, don't want to talk but they're polite. Uh, gave a tract is when you just are able to hand them a tract but they don't want to talk at all. A brief discussion is when you might hand them a tract and then you might mention a couple of things, you know, preach a very, very short gospel is a brief discussion. Heard the gospel or an in-depth discussion is when you get into a bit more things where you're showing them scriptures, you're discussing things, you've preached the gospel to them. You've got following up not saved and following up saved, which is, which is a church member or somebody that's saved already. Somebody who got saved, so they called upon the name of the Lord. Somebody who's already saved, so we separated that up because we wanted to see how many people we had led to the Lord as opposed to people that were already saved out there. The last one we have is aggressive. And I put it pink just because I don't really like the color pink really much. And you know, that was a color that we hadn't used. So we, you can see the color scheme is kind of like cold to hot, right? Saved is red, the blood of Jesus Christ. So aggressive was, was pink. Now aggressive is if somebody like curses you away, you know, people are like, don't come back, slam the door, 
that sort of stuff. People that don't, you know, if you were to go back, would get angry with you. Now, we mark those as aggressive, but if you notice the number, there's only 37. 37 out of 12,000 doors. 37 people said were rude and said, don't come back, slammed the door, cursed at us, whatever. So Mike, I, what I want you to reflect on is like, what are you scared of? You're scared to go soul winning. They're, they're more scared of us. And it's like, with, I'm scared. I don't like cockroaches. I don't like spiders. You know, I say, spider's probably more scared of you than you are of it. It's probably true. But, you know, that's why I got I to think about those things too. But, you know, they, you know they're, they're more scared of you than, than we are of them. And look how many people actually, you know, chances are if you don't go soul winning that often, you probably won't even come across one of those doors. You know, generally the experience would be you go door knocking, people don't want to talk. You know, um, so it's about trying to get people to talk. But there's nothing to be scared of because people really are not as aggressive as you think they are. So, hey, door knocking works in the sense that people are hearing the gospel. 830 people hearing the gospel because of this church and not just because of me. You know, it's because of everyone that's involved. And hey, if more people were involved, hey, that number is going to hopefully double next year of how many people are hearing the gospel. And as we increase in knowledge, increase in, in, in um, skill, hey, hopefully we'll get better. And that's, that's, really, that's one thing I want to say as well. You know, with our soul winning, hey, as we move forward, hey, let's not just only increase in the quantity of our soul winning. You know, what do I mean by quantity? You know, well, so, some of you that haven't gone soul winning yet, you know, you need to at least go. You need, you need to increase the number from zero to at least one. That'll be like an infinite percentage increase, right? If you go from zero to one. Um, so some of you have to definitely get involved at least one time or another. You know, other ways you can increase the quantity of your soul winning is, you know, maybe spend more time out soul winning. You know, if you're going soul winning once a week or once a month and you're only going one hour, hey, maybe next time go two hours, maybe go two and a half hours. You know, you can, it's easier, I find, to spend more, a little bit more time out that one time than to go twice a week, obviously, because you've got the travel time and all that. So you can just spend a bit more time on the one day rather than doing two. Um, you know, if right now you're only going now and then, you're going maybe once a month, you're going every uh, in time when you have time, hey, try, why don't you try and make it weekly? Increase the quantity that way. You know, schedule it into your life rather than, well, I've got nothing else to do, I may as well go soul winning. You know, because if you just wait until you have the time, I mean, things always come up. Do you know what I mean? Because we all work full-time jobs here. You've got Saturday and Sunday pretty much. You've got to get chores done. You've got things done. Hey, if you don't schedule in the soul winning, you're just going to not do it. That's, that's just the reality of life. If you don't make it a priority, things always come up because there's only so many weekends and everyone wants to do things on the weekends. And the more people you know, the less time you're going to have on the weekend. So you've got to make it a priority. Um, so not, I don't want us to only increase in the quantity of our soul winning. So obviously more people going, more hours out soul winning. But hey, I want us to as well increase in the quality of our soul winning. For those of us especially that are a bit more uh, further in the faith, I find what happens is you start to coast on what you already know. You know, like you, you, you get lazy in soul winning. Since you're still going soul winning. Right? But you've preached the gospel so many times, so many times, so many times that you're not really excelling in the faith. You're not really moving forward in what you know. You, know, I rem you remember when you first started going soul winning? You, you, know, you heard the answers about eternal security, you know, about the gospel and things like that. And you, you were hungry to know the answers, to find out, hey, how do I answer that next time? But what happens when you start preaching the gospel, preaching the gospel, preaching the gospel, when somebody doesn't want to listen? It's like, oh, okay, it's just because they don't want to listen. It's not thinking, hey, how, do, how can I engage this person? Or what, what do I need to know so that I can explain the gospel to this person? Like Alex prayed this morning. You know, what do we know about Buddhism? I don't know much about Buddhism. Hey, there's something we can learn. Increase the quality of our soul winning. There are Buddhists out there that need the gospel too. And if we don't know how to attack that faith, then we're not going to be as effective as we could be reaching a, a, a Buddhist. You know, if we don't know much about Islam, hey, we need to learn about Islam so that we can be more effective in reaching the Muslims out there. So let's not just increase in the quantity of our soul winning, but the quality of our soul winning. You, know, you need to know what you're talking about. You need to have scriptures memorized. You need to know where you're going. You know, if you're new to soul winning, hey, use a script. You know, think about what you're going to say at the door so that you go prepared. You need to purpose in your heart to learn. And, you know, this is going to take time and commitment on your part. 
It takes time. It takes commitment to learn things. So it requires a commitment and a passion uh, about what our purpose is in this life. And you know, the more you know about doctrine, the more you know about the faith, the more enjoyable soul winning is. See, the reason why people don't enjoy going out soul winning, I mean, obviously it's difficult, you know, just getting yourself out there. But some of the reasons why people don't enjoy soul winning is because they don't know what they're talking about. But if you know what you're talking about, it's, it's more exciting. Because when, when somebody answers a question, you know how to answer it. It's kind of like with any sport or with fighting. You know, I use the analogy of mixed martial arts. There's a reason why mixed martial arts is the most effective form of fighting. Why? Because they don't just learn a one specific specialty. They need to learn all of it because they need to know, hey, what can I learn from that skill? But also, how can I defend against that skill? And I see soul winning as spiritual mixed martial arts. We need to know the different religions out there. We need to know how people attack the faith. We need to know how to defend the faith. And it's going to make us like a, a more effective soul winner. Now, if you stepped into a fight, Maybe, maybe I'll change over to, um, to the sport of soccer, right? I'm reaching to Alex right now. You know, it's just like with soccer, right? You know, we just started a futsal competition. You know, and I, I've been taking a bit of time just to learn from some basics about soccer and to learn, hey, what am I trying to do on the field and how to be a more effective player? Because I don't want to just join this competition and just get smashed, right? Because that's not fun. You don't want to join a futsal competition and you're just losing, like you're just getting thrashed week after week after week after week. It's the same with soul winning. You don't want to go out soul winning and just get, get thrashed week after week after week, don't know what you're talking about. I mean, it's going to discourage you. You're not going to have fun anymore. But if you start learning and start knowing what you're talking about, hey, you go in prepared, hey, at least if you, you lose, you're going to go down fighting. It's going to be a bit more fun. So if you increase in the quality of your soul winning, it's going to be a lot more enjoyable. It's no different to sports. It's no indif different to fighting. And those of us who are more experienced at soul winning, hey, don't get lazy. You know, let's continue to learn. Um, it's so easy for us to just coast on what we know and just keep going soul winning with what we know and we stop learning more uh, than we could. So that's a soul winning. And number two, you know, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So are you baptized? You know, if you're not baptized, then hey, we've got to get you baptized. You know, this is one of the first steps of obedience in the faith is to be baptized. You know, if, if baptism was optional, why is it part of the Great Commission? You know, if Jesus is commanding us to teach all nations and then baptize them and then teach them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, obviously then baptism is not optional because Jesus is commanding us to baptize people. Um, if it was up to the person, then it wouldn't be commanded for us to do it. So are you baptized? If you're not, let's get you baptized. Um, and one thing I just wanted to note in this verse here, you know, some people believe that baptism is only for Jews. Um, just in this verse here, if baptism was only for Jews, then why would we be commanded to baptize all nations? Because it says here, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them. So the them is the all nations in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So baptism is for everyone, Jew and Gentile. Um, and it's Immersion as a believer. So we believe here baptism by immersion. If you were sprinkled as a child in the Orthodox or the Catholic Church, you're not baptized yet. You know, you need to be saved in order to get baptized. If you got baptized as a child, you didn't believe. And if you just got sprinkled, you didn't get buried in baptism. So if you weren't saved, you're not baptized um, when you got sprinkled. And if you uh, weren't immersed, I don't believe that is baptism either. Now the last thing here is... Um, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Now, the last purpose of our church is to teach the Bible and to make disciples. And, you know, it's not just in the church. You know, we want to make disciples in our homes as well. You know, we need to make sure that we raise our children to love and to read the Bible and to teach them about the doctrines. It's not just going to absorb into them by osmosis through the church. You know, you need to teach your children how and what to do when it comes to the faith. So it's in our homes, it's within the church, but it's also out in the spiritual work. You know, because you can learn a lot of things about the faith in church, but you'll learn a lot out soul winning as well. When you come and you hear the objections, you hear how we talk about the faith, you'll learn a lot when you go soul winning. 
Now, if you want to be a disciple, I mean, you need to be here, right? I mean, you can't, you can't like, uh, not, if you want to be discipled, I mean, you need to be part of what's happening here. If you want to learn from people like myself or from Kevin or other people that are going to preach in this church, um, you need to be there. I want to just show you here, this is the last verse I'll go to, 23, 26. Because the responsibility, the responsibility lies on you to be a disciple. You know, the, the, the old proverb, right? You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink it. You know, if you want to be a disciple, it's, it's going to be up to you. You know, I can, I can try and, and build you up. I can preach you, take you out soul winning. But if you don't make it a point to actually learn and to grow, um, it's not going to do you any good. And sometimes, sometimes being a disciple just means being in the right place at the right time. You know, like sometimes we, we don't always have the right frame of mind. We don't always have the right perspective. But if you just stay on board, if you're just there at the right place at the right time, God might get a hold of your heart and you'll follow Jesus. I don't even realize this in Luke 23. It says here, and as they led him away, so they're talking about Jesus leading him away to be crucified. They lay hold upon one Simon, a Cyrenian, coming out of the country. And on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. A couple of other places in the Gospels, it says they compelled him to carry the cross. I mean, this Simon of Cyrene, he was just there actually leaving the country. It says he was coming out of the country, so he was heading home. But he was just in the right place at the right time. They grabbed him in order to carry the cross of Jesus. And he was carrying the cross after Jesus. That picture there of taking up your cross daily and following Jesus. Uh, in his death. So sometimes being a disciple is just being in the right place at the right time. If you're just there, if you're just, even if you're not always proactively involved, if you're around the right people, hey, you don't always have to be doing the talking out soul winning, but if you just tag along as a silent partner, you will grow, you will be used by the Lord Jesus, and hopefully you'll become a disciple and take up your own cross and follow him. And you know, I honestly think soul winning is the best way um, to learn about the faith. You know, it's like you know, going back to the, to the futsal, right? You know, I've been watching some videos to try and learn how to kick and things like that. But let's just say I watched those videos and that's all I did. If all I did is just watch tutorials about how to kick and how to pass, but I never actually played a game, I mean, how good do you think I'm going to be at soccer? I mean, I'm like, <laughs> you're not going to get any better by not doing it. And it's the same in the Christian life. You know, we're only going to get better and grow in our faith if we actually do some work and get involved and become a disciple. So hopefully that gives you some things to think about um, and hopefully that encourages you to, to move forward in your Christian life. Um, but uh, now we're going to pray and uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to pump up the jumping castle and get the gazebo up and everything like that. So hopefully you can stick around and just enjoy the fellowship and celebrations with everyone. All right, let's pray.